And on today's show, why foreign nationals are seeking help from American advisors. Part two of this week's series on the foreign national market in America with foreign national market expert and certified financial planner, Kerry Rockovich. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial economist and contributing author to Innsmark, Live Specs and Backroom Technician. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to the show, Carrie. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be here. Well, Carrie, if you missed our show yesterday, uh, we were talking about doing jail time in Mexico uh, <laughs> with foreign nationals. Well, okay, I guess if you say, Steve, what are you talking about? Go out and watch our show. And I think you should watch the show in sequence the entire week. Carrie, when we're talking about this, you know, I'm looking at, you know, you have residents, you know, U.S. residents, which we all are. We're born here. Then we have non-residents. We have green card. I mean, there's so many different definitions of what's your status. Absolutely. And so... Are these statuses looked upon differently by carriers? You know, they're going to have different rules of engagement. And I've noticed uh, in many carriers that have international reinsurance and or their actual parent company is an international player, mm -hmm. there seems to be a little bit more benevolence and a little bit more flexibility. That's absolutely right. So immigration status is very important in the foreign national market. Truly, what you're trying to define is whether the, the proposed insured should be underwritten as a U.S. resident or underwritten per mm -hmm. the rules of their home country. So green card, that's a permanent resident of the U.S. Mm -hmm. We know right off the bat what we need to do with that person. Um, with the visas, it can be a little bit harder because you've got to determine, is it a permanent visa, mm -hmm. one that we can underwrite as a U.S. resident, or is it a temporary visa where we've got to look back to the rules of the home country? So, so you have all the rules of the home country. You know every one Absolutely. of these rules. Absolutely. So you have to pull files on this to see you what you pull can the, do. you got to pull the immigration status. you got to pull the file on the country. Wow. you got to pull the file. Exactly. And then you've got to marry that, of course, mm. with the financial and the medical underwriting for the proposed insured. I was shocked when you told me that there is a huge volume of business in this arena. Yes. I have to say, I, I thought it would be... Okay, maybe it's not as niche as I thought. So talk to me about the volume of cases just yes. on that issue alone. Really the volume of the cases in the foreign national market come to us through the resident alien market. And that's those folks who are non-US citizens, but they live here in the United States. This group, really what we find is that they desire coverage for all the same reasons the United States mm -hmm. citizen, income protection, debt coverage, business solutions, mm -hmm. you know, covering a, a funeral, you know, this, mm -hmm. the exact same things that we're covering the U.S. for. Um, and that is, it, it's a, that's absolutely where the quantity of the cases come to us from. Now, when they're looking at this again, I remember we talked about this a little bit yesterday, the same lifetime estate exemptions that exist for a regular U.S. citizen is the same number that is for a non-resident. Is that correct? No, the, the lifetime exemptions for a U.S. resident, even a resident alien, mm -hmm. whether or not you're a U.S. citizen, lifetime exemptions are the same. 5.34 million for 2014. I think we're going to get a little bit of a lift for 2015. What uh, the, the, the big shocker is that non-resident alien market, their exemption is only 60,000. Okay, so, so as we said yesterday about the 60,000 exemption, 60,000 and there's no marital deduction. There's no unlimited marital Even deduction. Even if the spouse was an American citizen? If the spouse is a US citizen and they're the survivor, then yes, you get the unlimited okay, marital so, deduction. So let's just walk down that road just mm -hmm. for a quick second. So I have a foreign national married to an American spouse. Right. As long as that happens, then the 60,000 exemption is off the table and we're back to regular US rate tables. Maybe. Oh, you have maybe. a foreign national who's married to a United States citizen. That foreign national person, if they're a resident alien, at their death, they will get the full $5.34 million mm -hmm. exemption for 2014. Above and beyond that, for transfers to their US citizen spouse, they would get the unlimited mm. marital deduction. Now let's flip the story on its head. What if our US citizen spouse were the first to die? They'll get the 5.34 uh, exemption, because mm -hmm. they're a US citizen, Everything above and beyond that, that they're wanting to transfer to their spouse, there is no unlimited marital deduction. That's where we begin engaging in the qualified domestic trust planning. Now, from your experience in this market as a CFP, have you seen people plan for that worst scenario, which is that the actual American resident, the U.S. citizen, actually precedes her spouse in death? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Wow, so they're covering this off. Yes. Now, we're using the same estate tax table when we're talking about things of this nature, except on this first death scenario. Okay, I just want to make sure I get the idea because I see some huge opportunities here. Yes. Uh, now, uh, talk to me about um, a little bit about the assets that are exempt. You know, are there some assets that are exempt from estate tax? Mm -hmm. There's some things that we can say, hey, even if you're a U.S. citizen, non-U.S. citizen, you're a foreign national, you're a green card. I'm trying to think of all the statuses. Right. Uh, are there certain ex rules of engagement from a tax point of view? From a tax point of view, for your resident aliens, it's very much like a U.S. citizen. Basically, their worldwide assets are mm -hmm. going to be looked at. Anything that they've got ownership is going to be looked at when it comes time to calculate estate taxes. For the non-resident aliens, mm -hmm. really, it's only the U.S. sightest assets. Mm -hmm. Remember the non-resident aliens. Those are our folks who have assets here in the United States, but they do not mm -hmm. make the U.S. their permanent home. So a lot of times it'll be their business or mm -hmm. real estate or sometimes it's large investment accounts that they have here in a U.S. dollar denominated account. Um, that is where you're going to find the largest mm -hmm. case because those folks only have that $60,000 exemption to apply at death against the assets that they own. Now, interestingly enough, um, if a non-resident alien is the owner of their own U.S. life insurance contract, that death benefit is not pulled back into their U.S. estate. So it's a very simple solution to provide the needed liquidity since they've only got that $60,000 exemption. So, so for some reason, that is not included. It is not included. Now, is that because of a U.S. code or is that the country of, that they came from or is that just the way it is? It's because it's not considered a U.S. situst property uh -huh. when that non-resident alien is, since they do not live here in the U.S. Well, we come back from the break. We're going to continue our talk. I'm, I'm on a learning curve here, I have to say. Somewhat steep, but I think I like it because I see this market as a real play and maybe a possible possibility of pulling you out of the pack and looking and making your practice look like something special. We'll be right back. It's not how much money you make for your clients, it's how much money they get to keep, especially in retirement. But retirement income could cause Social Security benefits to be taxed. One tax advantage alternative is life insurance designed as a non-modified endowment contract that can generate tax-free income without taxing Social Security benefits. These contracts offer differing funding options depending upon your client's risk tolerance. For more information on how life insurance can be part of your retirement planning, just email me at steve at downtobusiness.tv. Brought to you by Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, welcome back to the second segment. I'm Steve Savan, of course, your host. And with me, Carrie Rockovich. Carrie is a certified financial planner, a CLU, and a CHFC. And she's totally into this narrow. Oh, I thought it was narrow. I shouldn't say it any longer. <laughs> this looks like a very expanding market of foreign nationals where nobody, I, and I, I'm finding there's a lot of people that aren't really in this market. This could be a huge area to really niche yourself out and really, I would say, enhance your practice, especially on LinkedIn, Facebook. I mean, if you could get on Google that you're into this as a advisor, this could be huge for your practice. Now, I noticed, you know, when we're talking about the qualified domestic trust, you know, the, yes. we're talking about QDOT, how do the rules apply here? Is that a little different? QDOT planning, what an interesting animal. Mm. Um, let's, let's kind of break it down. So that's back to our situation where we've got uh, you're, typically what you'll find is a United States citizen who's married to a non-U.S. citizen. And let's just assume that they're living here in the United States. When our U.S. citizen passes away, they'll get the $5.34 million exemption. But for the assets above and beyond that, remember there's no unlimited marital mm -hmm. deduction when it's passing to that non-U.S. citizen spouse. So the planning technique that can be applied is using the qualified domestic trust. So everything above and beyond the 5.34 for 2014 would be shoveled into the QDOT. Now, QDOT planning is, can be somewhat of an administrative burden. You've got to have a U.S. trustee, and s typically they'll need to be bonded. It depends upon the assets mm -hmm. that pass into the QDOT trust, but usually we're talking pretty significant assets whenever we get into this type of planning. Um, the problem with that QDOT is that it's, while it saves the estate tax at the time that our first spouse passes away, for our surviving resident alien spouse, they're able to take the income from the trust, no estate tax would be applied. Um, they could access the principal, typically it's gotta be for you know health, education, maintenance, support, and no estate tax would be, uh, be applied. But if they were to dig into that principal for any other reason, immediately the estate tax would be applied. 
I'm looking at your example of a Peruvian national. Yes. You're a U.S. resident, you know, uh, 15 million in U.S. assets, 20 million in Peruvian assets. The U.S. estate tax liability on the gross estate of 35 million, that tax liability is 11.8, close, mm -hmm. close to $12 million. Mm -hmm. I would say that they need a huge defensive posture for that. Talk about that case. Okay, so with this case, this this a very this was a very large case for us. So definitely, QDOT planning was in the mix for the survivor, um, and the QDOT can even be you know that can be set up posthumously. They, you can leave it to the surviving spouse to determine whether or not assets need to go into mm -hmm. the QDOT. So when you're going to plan with the QDOT, a great technique. What happens is at the death of our surviving spouse. All assets and any appreciation inside that QDOT is taxed back to the first spouse's death. Mm. So there's no additional exemption that gets applied from that second spouse. All those assets come back and they're all taxed at basically the top rate. So a survivor policy could be a great way to plan mm -hmm. when you've got two non-U.S. citizens who are planning for U.S. estate taxes. That survivor can meet mm -hmm. up at the second death, pay off the taxes for the QDOT. Well, on this exposure, on this one case alone, the exposure was something like it could erode the estate almost 34%. I mean, that's exactly. a chunk of change. It's huge. When you think about it, you're looking at, is most of these cases then, are they're going to all have to be owned probably by an islet then, right? Um, on the life, especially the life insurance side of this equation? Many times with the resident aliens, mm -hmm. you will find that it's best. An islet could be a, such a simple solution mm -hmm. compared to the QDOT planning. Mm -hmm. So you could have just an islet with individual life insurance on your U.S. citizen spouse that would pay out at the time of their death for the non-U.S. citizen spouse. That's a, that's a very simple solution um, to this situation, absolutely. Now, if I'm using an islet life insurance, which will provide liquidity for the estate and so mm -hmm. forth, the if, if you've seen there because we're coming from we're having people come from different cultures. Yes. They have maybe different ways of looking at things. Maybe our lifestyle credits won't apply. Maybe our table shaving. Are we maybe if we're a table shaver like many carriers are? Do these things still are they still treating these people like regular American citizens in life credits, underwriting protocols? table shaving programs or how they approach maybe a malady or a disease that they have? You know, the medical underwriting from the, the underwriter's perspective is very much the same. What can be really hard about medical underwriting for the foreign national market is when you have someone who grew up in an area that maybe did not have prenatal care, did not have, you know, the types of services that we find in an industrialized country. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to be aligned with a partner who's got the underwriting background for these types of cases, because that in itself can um, deter a life insurance company from being interested and, in a And you have insurance. actual underwriters are very schooled in this. Absolutely, wow. absolutely. Well, one last thing before we uh, close out the show, financial justification, and that has to be the big one. Financial justification is always the big one. Yeah, it's always yes, the big one. We've got to be able to make sure that that proposed insured can financially qualify based upon their own assets. And we can look at things like what is the U.S. estate tax exposure? We can also look at things that what what is the you know loss economically looking at all of your global assets. We've even been able to get in and look at some very interesting cases where a particular country has forced airship laws that would cut out a daughter and be able to provide the life insurance to do some estate equalization to make sure that the female children of a family are also taken care of. That is so amazing. I'm sorry that we. this is all the time we have for today. I just want to follow up. We'll catch you tomorrow. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, and your broker-dealer compliance department. And now I have to add another one, the carrier who's writing this business. <laughs> Missed an episode? Just hop out to our video archives. And remember, you could be wiser as an educated advisor. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you tomorrow.